good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, and to pray for those who spitefully use us and who abuse us. Uh, We pray that you would give us love in the body of Christ, that we would put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. We ask that the peace of Christ would rule our hearts and that each one of us would be thankful. May the word of Christ richly dwell within us. I do pray for my brothers and sisters here at Ely Presbyterian Church uh, that you would continue to bind them together in unity. And we thank you for the work of the elders, for the deacons, and for all the members. And we give you praise for the work of the school, and we pray for the teachers, and we pray for the children. We thank you that these children are being instructed in the knowledge and admonition of the Lord. And we thank you for the communicant classes that have taken place recently. Uh, we pray that you would put a burden on these young people's hearts to seek membership in the church and to serve the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our denomination, for the Evangelical Presbyterian Churches in England and in Wales. We give you thanks for the 23 or so churches in our denomination. We pray that you would raise up more ruling elders, that you would raise up more ministers of the gospel to fill empty pulpits. We do ask that there would be peace and unity and love where there is strife in various congregations. Particularly at this time, we pray for the All Saints congregation, And we pray for the Sheffield congregation, that you would bring peace and love and joy, and that the gospel focus would remain, that they would remain focused on spreading the gospel across Newcastle and across Sheffield. Father, you have called us to avoid foolish controversies. You have called us to avoid dissensions and quarrels. We know that these things are unprofitable. They are worthless. We ask that you would protect our churches, protect Ely, protect Bethel, uh, protect uh, Emmanuel, protect Christ Church in Barry, protect us from those who would stir up division, and knowing that such division is warped, it is sinful, and that those who do these things are self-condemned. Uh, we thank you for not leaving your churches alone. We thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit. Uh, We believe what you have said in your word, that the the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, uh, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. And so we pray that you, by your Spirit, would open the minds and the hearts of those who do not believe, that they would see Jesus Christ as he is presented this evening in the gospel, and that they would embrace him as the only Savior. We ask that you would bring conviction, that you would cut people to the heart, and that you would grant them a longing for Jesus Christ. May that be true here tonight. May it be true across the denomination, the churches in our denomination. Oh Lord, we ask that you would stir up a longing in people's hearts across Ely and Cairo, as they maybe sit outside, or they drink with friends in the pub, or they watch television, would suddenly a longing for, the, for Christ come upon their hearts, a seeking of that which is real and true, rather than seeking after things that do not last. Uh, give them a hope, we pray, a, a hope that will not be cut off. Uh, may they know that there is a future, a future of either eternal life or eternal death. Bring conviction to the hearts of the people in our community. We ask that this conviction would grow in across the British Isles, and to the very ends of the earth. Uh, We lift up to you the nation of Ukraine at this particular time. We thank you for the work of our sister churches in Hungary as they uh, reach out to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, We pray as refugees return to homes and villages to rebuild what has been destroyed, that you would give strength and raise up your ministers to empower and inspire and encourage your people through, through difficult times. Uh, we pray especially for those who have young men in their families, children turning 18, going off to war. And we pray especially for Christian brothers and sisters who are watching their, their family members going off to what seems like an uncertain future. Father, in the Ukraine, we pray for mercy. Have mercy upon your people there. Uh, we ask our God 
uh, that you, again, we pray for those needs, those pastoral needs here in this church. Uh, we pray for Pauline again, and we pray for Paul, and we pray uh, for Alan McCabe. Lord, have mercy upon our brothers and sisters. Father, you, you are gracious. You, you are so good to us. Uh, we pray that you would be continue to show your goodness to us now as we look at your word. Would you give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. And we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer which our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We praise thee, we bless thee, our Father divine, all power and dominion forever be thine. reading this evening is from the Old Testament, uh, from, from the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 23. As you can probably guess, in, Beth, in Bethel we're going through Luke in the morning and Proverbs uh, in the evening. And uh, you may very well remember when I preached some time ago, although I won't hold it against you if you don't remember, that I preached on Proverbs chapter 1 uh, many, many months ago. And uh, this is where we're up to in Bethel. We're in Proverbs uh, 23. 
So uh, I'll begin reading at verse 1, and I'm going to read the entire chapter. Proverbs 23, verse 1. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth, and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her, her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber, and increases the traitors among mankind. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. We thank God for his words. Before we look at that portion of Proverbs, we are going to sing our next hymn, Father, like a shepherd, lead us. <clears throat>
as you can see on our uh, order of uh, service, uh, the sermon tonight from Proverbs 23, it is called uh, Greed and Gluttony. I, um, I did joke with the elders on Friday night and Saturday morning. We were at Presbytery together, and uh, we had a meal together on Friday night, and we had breakfast together on Saturday morning, and I, I warned them that I would be preaching on uh, greed and gluttony uh, tonight, so it was rather appropriate. Uh, I am... Um, I'm sure we've, we've all heard uh, somewhere um, of the seven deadly sins, um, the, the Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, the seven deadly sins, and we've maybe heard of it because of our upbringing, maybe we were brought up in, in the Roman Catholic tradition, or because of pop culture, the, the idea of the seven deadly sins has made its way uh, into various novels and also into uh, several films. Uh, the seven deadly sins is a Roman Catholic doctrine uh, which speaks of, of seven vices which can spur us on to other sins and to further immoral behavior. Uh, the seven deadly sins are, are vain glory or, or pride, uh, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Now, there is much attached to the Roman Catholic doctrine of the seven deadly sins with which we as Protestants would, would disagree. Yet, at its most basic level, we would agree with, agree with our Roman Catholic friends that, that these sins are, are, are very deadly, and these sins are very dangerous. All sins are deadly, all sins are dangerous, but the consequences of some sins, they are more deadly and dangerous than others. Vainglory, greed, lust, gluttony, envy, wrath, and sloth, they are deadly and dangerous sins indeed. Proverbs has something to say about each of these deadly sins. In chapter 8 and verse 13, it cautions us uh, against the, uh, the dangers of pride. So it says, Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Uh, it also warns us of the dangers of lust. So uh, we read in Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, the father says to his son, Keep your way far from the adulteress. And do not go near the door of her house. Uh, Proverbs also alerts us to the enemy of envy. In chapter 14 and verse 30, we read, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Uh, Proverbs informs us of, of, the, of the perils of wrath. So if you were to look at chapter 22 and verse 24, it says, uh, Make no friendship with a man given to anger nor go with a wrathful man. And Proverbs also advises us to stay away from the slothful. There's that, that wonderful picture in, in chapter 6 and verse 6. You remember uh, the writer says, he says, Go to the ant, O sluggards. You're one that slugs along. You know, look at the ant. The ant is working. Consider her ways. Consider her ways and be wise. Don't be slothful. Don't be a sluggard. Work hard like, like the ant works hard. Uh, chapter 23 now, as we come to chapter 23, it speaks about the two remaining deadly sins. Chapter 23 speaks about greed and gluttony. Now, I, I'm no expert in Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, that's for sure, but, um, but certainly in my mind, greed and gluttony uh, seem to very, be very closely related. Th there are different forms of greed, uh, and one of those forms is gluttony. Uh, a glutton wants more. A glutton cannot control his desires. Uh, some are greedy for food, uh, some are greedy for wealth, some are greedy for drink. Uh, this evening, we're going to look at what Proverbs has to say about these two deadly and dangerous sins. Uh, but before we do that, do that, let's remind ourselves of, of who is writing uh, and to whom this person is writing as a bit of background, because we're kind of just jumping in again at Proverbs chapter 23. So, so who is writing? Well, if you go back to chapter 22 and verse 17, you'll notice there that a new section of Proverbs begins. If, if you have the English Standard Version, it has a heading there, and it says the words of the wise ones, or, or words of the wise. And, and verse 17 says, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. The, word, the wise ones are, are writing this particular section of Proverbs. And this section of Proverbs continues all the way through to chapter 24 and verse 22, where you have this 
wise one or these wise ones who are writing. Uh, chapter 22 and, and verse 20 says that the wise one has written 30 sayings of counsel and knowledge to make us know what is right and what is true. These sayings are words which are spoken like a father to a son. A father is speaking to his son, and a father is urging his son to listen to, to what he has to say. He's pleading with his son almost. Son, look, I've only got you for a short time, and then I'm going to push you out of the nest, and you've got your life to live, and I'm pleading with you, take these 30 sayings on board. These things, I want you to know these things before you leave my house. And, and so we have in, in chapter 23, as you may have noticed in the reading earlier, we, we have uh, the, the, fa the father really speaking to his son, saying words like this in verse 19. Uh, Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Uh, earlier, uh, the wise one had, had been saying, like, like a father to a son. He says in verse 13 of chapter 23, uh, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. And, and what the father really seems to be saying there is that the discipline comes in many forms. And in order to grow and in order to live a wise life, you need to have discipline. And one of the ways that discipline comes to us from a father to a son is through words. And the way that the Lord disciplines his people and chastises his people is through words. Uh, you may remember in, in the prophet Hosea, um, the Lord says through his prophet that, that he says, look, I, I, I've, I've hewn you with my prophets. I've slain you with the words of my mouth. Uh, the Lord is chastising and speaking to his people. He's disciplining his people. And so we see here this father speaking to his son, speaking like a father to a son in, in chapter 23, giving these words of correction. Uh, I think often we think of discipline as something which is negative. But in the scriptures, uh, we see that discipline is something which is restorative. It brings a change of heart. It brings repentance. It saves from Sheol, as it says in chapter 23. It, it saves from the place of, of death. But like all discipline, it, it's hard. It's painful. It's hard to receive. The rod, which is spoken about here, the rod is painful. The rod hurts. But sometimes pain is necessary in order to bring the change of heart which is required. Uh, the surgeon, in order to save life, he, he must make an incision. Uh, the rotting tooth, it must be removed. Uh, the gangrenous arm, it may need to be amputated. Uh, painful words, they, they are often necessary. And the wise one has some hard things to say to us here in chapter 23. It's like a father having a, a very tough conversation with his son. So who is writing? It's the wise one who is writing. But who is speaking? You know, the biggest mistake we could make when reading Proverbs is to just think of it as like any other piece of ancient wisdom literature, you know, something from the past which is kind of beneficial in a kind of general way uh, for all people. Oh, it's just like the, the ancient near eastern literature of, of that particular time it's like the gilgamesh or the the prophets of uh, the proverbs of amenopet or it's, it's just like the philosophical writings of of socrates and and plato and aristotle uh, we we mustn't think like that a man is writing but it's the covenant lord who is speaking and the covenant lord is speaking to his people our heavenly father in, in proverbs 23 he is speaking to his children. He, he's speaking to us through his Son and by the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit is making known to us the things which belong to the Son. The Spirit of truth is guiding us into all truth as we read Proverbs 23. We're not just reading something to help us only in our day-to-day -day life. We're reading the very words of God, and God is speaking to us. So that, that's the one who is writing but to whom is the wise one writing? Well, what we see, what we must remember with Proverbs is that the wise one is writing to the people of God. He is writing to those who 
are in a covenant relationship with God. Uh, we find here general principles, which, yes, can be useful in our daily lives, but this is a, a piece of writing which is aimed specifically at the people of God. It's, it's aimed at those who have, the Lord has said of them, you shall be my people and, and I shall be your God. We, we do not read these words uh, and we think to ourselves, you know what, if I, if I kind of read these and just do these things, then I can sort of earn some merit for myself. And then maybe if I live a wise life, that God will accept me, God will be happy with me, and therefore I'll get myself into heaven one day because I've followed the wisdom of these things. So what we must remember is that the covenant Lord has made a way for us to know him. Uh, the covenant Lord has made a way for us to be saved and in relationship with him. And that is through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved. We, we are accepted. And because we are saved, because we are his people, because we are accepted, therefore, in thankfulness for what he has done for us, we live. We want to live according to his ways. The, the thought of doing things which displease him, it, it's horrible to us. And so we want to hear God's words, even if they're hard. We want to hear what God has to say to us. And so we see there who is writing, and we see to whom he is writing. And now let, let's come into Proverbs 23. Uh, and I want to look here at, at three dangers uh, relating to greed and to gluttony. Uh, so firstly, the danger number one, I want to look at the danger of gluttony itself. The danger of gluttony. In, in, in chapter 23, it begins in, in verses 1 to 3. And then it carries on and goes on. And, and, and there are different sections where gluttony just seems to weave itself in and out of this chapter. So let's touch on those verses. Verses 1 to 3, we see there, we, we read of a man who, who surely has forsaken the covenant of God. He, he is a rich host, and what he does is he uses his wealth to entrap, entrap his, his less well-off guests so that they feel obliged to do his bidding. He, he's like a, an abusive boyfriend, really, who, who buys his girlfriend all sorts of stuff, but he does that to control her. And this rich host is, is a bit like that. Uh, uh, the writer warns against desiring the de delicacies of this person who gives all this food to control you in some way. And so we see in verse 2, he says, uh, put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetites. Uh, you want to eat this food, uh, but as you're about to eat this food, your mind is warning you of the dangers of eating this particular food and how it's going to entrap you but your stomach is saying, oh, I want it. I want these delicacies. The, the desire of your stomach, the desire of your stomach becomes stronger than the warnings of wisdom and the warnings of your conscience. Then we come to verses 6 to 8. Uh, and the reader is, uh, for similar reasons, warned against eating the bread of a man who is stingy. Uh, the, the stingy man says, eat and drink. But then verse 7 says, his heart is not with you. Uh, the bread, it is being used to entice you. The bread is being used to, to trap you. After realizing that the bread has been used as a snare, as verse 8 says, you will vomit up. It will vomit up. It will all come out. Uh, the morsels that you have eaten. Uh, this, this vomit probably signifies the, the regret and the revulsion that you feel after seeing the consequences of giving in to your appetite. In the second century, uh, there lived a Christian writer whose name was Tatian the Syrian. And Tatian the Syrian, in one of his works, he, he wrote about a number of the Greek philosophers. He wasn't a big fan of the Greek philosophers, and he wrote about many of their vices. And he wrote about uh, the philosopher Diogenes. And Diogenes was that man who would walk around Athens, and he would carry a lamp, and he would use the lamp looking for an honest man. And Diogenes, later on, he, he moved from Athens, he moved to Corinth. And he lived with a family in Corinth. And around about the age of 90, he was eating and he was drinking. And, and Diogenes, um, sorry, uh, Tatian describes Diogenes as a glutton. And so he's eating and he's eating and, and he eats a raw ox's foot. And he's suddenly inflicted with a stomach ailment, probably food poisoning. And he dies. And uh, Tatian says, Diogenes lost his life by gluttony. Uh, verses 20 to 21, then, they give sound advice. 
In view of what we've read here in, verse tw in chapter 23, verses 20 to 21, they give us very sound advice. You notice there it says, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. And meat was the, the rich man's meal. Uh, not everyone was able to eat meat like we are able today. So it says, Be not among the gluttonous eaters of meat. For what reason? It says in verse 21, For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. Uh, those within the covenant of grace, the, the covenant people of the Lord, they should avoid the snares of gluttony. They should avoid the trap of giving in to their desires. Why? Well, it tells us in verse 21, it, it impoverishes people. It, it will bring those who give in to their appetites, it will give, bring them to ruin, and your greed will ruin others who, who really, if you think about it, they could, many people could, could feed their families for an entire month with sometimes one course meal that we have on a particular day. There, there is so much food in the world and so many are able to, to not, not to access it. And so we see here this, these dangers of gluttony. But what I want us to notice as we continue on is it's the desires that it's talking about. It's what's going on here in the heart. It's not so much the food itself that's the problem. It's the desires and the warnings which are given and the conscience speaking and, and wisdom speaking. And yet, rather than listening to what God is saying, we give in. Our heart gives in to those particular desires. And so we, we move on to the next danger which is the danger of wealth. Uh, we see in, in verse 4, the covenant Lord, he tells his covenant people not to toil to acquire wealth. And then he says, be discerning enough to desist. Uh, th there are two dangers here. There, there's the obvious danger, and then there's the not so obvious danger. So let's begin by looking at the obvious danger. Uh, what's the obvious danger? Well, well, the obvious danger from verse 4 is, is the love of money. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul tells us that in the last days that the people will be lovers of themselves. They will be lovers of money. Uh, and the, the, the two are closely connected. Uh, lovers of money are often lovers of themselves. Uh, we look at the life of Jesus, and, and Jesus did not toil to acquire wealth. He was discerning enough to desist. Those who follow Jesus, verse 4 tells us, should not toil to acquire wealth. Levi, you may remember, had, had toiled to acquire wealth. But one call from Jesus and he gets up from his booth and he leaves that all behind and he follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Lydia was a seller of purple cloth, you may remember. She was wealthy. A seller of purple cloth meant she was probably a wealthy person and yet she used her resources for the good of the church. Judas was a lover of money, and he traded his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Wealth is not the problem. It's the love of wealth that's the problem. Verse 4, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be, be discerning enough to desist. Here are these heart issues again, this greed which, which comes in. Uh, we often hear people say, don't we, getting the quote wrong. They say, money is the root of, of all evil. And the apostle doesn't say that. He, he says it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, Proverbs has a whole lot to say about the economic life uh, and how we're to work hard and we're to store up and we're to save and we're to provide for our children and to provide for our children's children. There's nothing wrong with the economic life, but it's the love of these things. It's the heart issues that becomes the particular problem. One of the, the most well-known figures in church, probably not so well-known figures in, in church history, is, is the Victorian uh, philanthropist, Anthony Ashley Cooper. You remember him? He's uh, well, probably better known as, as Lord Shaftesbury. Uh, and he was a wealthy man. Uh, and he was a man of influence. But he didn't use that wealth and store it up only for himself. He, he used it for, for the good of others. So he, he used his wealth and he used his influence to to introduce various uh, uh, bills into Parliament to, to improve the conditions of those who were mentally ill. Uh, he used his wealth and he, he used his, his influence to uh, improve um, uh, working conditions for, for chimney sweeps, how they would send boys up the chimney sweeps. And he, and he managed to get that abolished, that so the children weren't sent up the chimney stacks. He managed to work 
to, to work very hard, use his wealth, use his influence to stop women and children working more than 10 hours a day. Now just think of what people what work today, but we, we see there that how hard life was and how he used that to improve the conditions. It wasn't the love of money that drove him. He had these things, but he wasn't toiling to acquire those things. He was using what he had for the good of others. So, so that's the obvious danger, but there's a not-so-obvious danger. What's the, the not-so-obvious danger? Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. Well, well the not-so-obvious danger is, is the danger of overwork. It's the danger of overwork. As we've said already, there's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. There are plenty, plenty of wealthy people in the Bible. We think of Abraham, and we think of Joseph, and David, and Solomon. But the problem, again, is the heart. The problem comes when we trust everything to that wealth. And so we overwork to, to gather for ourselves security. Uh, we overwork to gather for ourselves identity. Uh, we overwork... Uh, so that we can feel more secure and enjoy more the things that we have, to, to place all our hope and all our trust in the things of this world. And, and in a sense, we might say that this overwork becomes gluttonous. Uh, this overwork becomes greedy. Uh, this overwork, it becomes addictive. Have you ever known someone who works so hard and you tell them to stop and they just cannot seem to stop? They've got to get more, got to get more, they've got to get more. And they become greedy. They, they're addicted to the security, the identity, the prestige that money can buy. Rather than, in a sense, being addicted to the right things. <laughs> having their hearts seeking the Lord's. And they become idolatrous for money. Uh, idolatry, we are told, really, a summary of what idolatry is, is, is trusting in created things rather than the creator for, for our hope, our happiness, our significance, and our security. We read of the apostles, and the apostles, they had very little, but what they did have, they had security. Even though they had very little, they had security, they had identity, they had worth, they had value. Why? Because they found those things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the apostle Paul said that I want to know Christ. I want him. I, I, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Uh, what is going to happen? What is going to happen if you love money? Or, or if you find your identity in, in gluttonous overwork? What is going to happen? Well, look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, When your eyes light on it, it is gone. Uh, for suddenly... It sprouts wings, flying like an eagle towards heaven. I've almost got it. I've almost got it. I'm going to grab hold of it. I'm going to get that thing that I need and everything will be secure and I'll have my identity. I just got to work a little bit harder and I grab hold of it and it grows wings and it flies away and it's gone. Because nothing in this world can provide security like the Lord can provide security. He is the one who provides us worth, identity, value. And so we must seek those things in him. We must not seek those things in wealth and overwork. And we come now to, to the third danger. And the third danger is, is the danger of wine. Uh, and, and the covenant Lord in, in Proverbs 23, he speaks to his covenant people about the dangers of wine. The, the theologians of the of the seven deadly sins, link wine or, or other strong drink. They linked it with gluttony. And you know how the song, maybe you know the song, it goes, oh, for good wine, oh, for the pleasure it brings. And seeking that pleasure in the strong drink. Now, these verses uh, speak about the dangers of wine and they, they speak for themselves. Look at, at verses 20 and 21 again. It says, be not among drunkards, or among gluttonous eaters of meats. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. And then verses 29 to 35, they speak for themselves. You have the, the warning of, of verse 29. Here's the warning. Who has woe? 
Uh, who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And then we see the problem. Who has these things? Well, it's those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. It says, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. And then you see the consequences. Verses 31 to 32, sorry, yeah, 32 to 35, the consequences. In the end, it bites like a serpent and, and stings like an adder. It's describing a drunk person, a drunkard. You, your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. I love this imagery. You, you'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. There you are on the top of the mast. The worst place to be on, on a boat if you can easily get seasick. And it goes this way and it goes that way. And so it is with the drunkard stumbling and going this way and that way until there's a sickness and until it all comes out. And then it goes, verse 35, they struck me, you will say, but, but I was not hurt. They, they beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. When's the next drink coming? I've got to have the next drink. I've got to have the next drink. Notice again the, the danger in which we've been told. It's not wine itself. That, that's, that's not the danger. Wine itself, it, it is never condemned in the Bible. It's a good gift from God, as it is with food, as it is with wealth and the economic life. These are good gifts which, which God has given to us. It can be enjoyed moderately by the people of God, especially when there are times of celebration, times of joy. Wine is particularly uh, appropriate on those particular occasions. The danger is not drink. The danger, we are told here, is drunkenness. Uh, Christians should not gorge themselves should not gorge themselves on wine. Christians should not get drunk and then go into all, all sorts of disorderly behavior which inevitably follows. We, we are those who carry the name of the triune God upon us, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and the behavior of a drunk man or a drunk woman, it brings dishonor on the name of God. Rather than being drunk on wine, we are told we're not to desire wine and have that over-desire for it. What are we told in Ephesians chapter 5? Rather than being drunk on wine, what should be our desire? It should be to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I stand on good ground here. We had Dr. Letham, Robert Letham, preach for us on Ephesians 5 last Sunday morning. He said, uh, be, you know, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He says the word there might be intoxicated or inebriated with the Spirit. Don't be drunk on the wine, but rather have that filling with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by the wine, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You see, those who have the wine controlling them, as, as we see in verse 33, their hearts utter perverse things. But Spirit-filled words, those who are Spirit-filled, they, they speak the excellencies of Jesus Christ. They speak of him, and they speak of his wonders, and they speak of his glories. No, we don't overly desire the things of, these wo of this world. There are many good gifts which God has given to us, but we are not greedy, overly greedy for these things, as if we ne only need these things. No, what we need is Christ, and we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I I've been to many funerals, which I'm sure you have, where you've been to funerals where, where people have missed this where well, they've thought about it as all was for this life. Uh, and so often they've seen all sorts of things, and, and it's getting crazier uh, the further the society goes away from the Lord. So we'll have people, uh, a coffin comes in with four cans of lager on the top, and the last one is opened as if this is his final drink. And this is how you want to be remembered, really? Uh, there is a life that is coming after. There is eternal death or there is eternal life what is it going to be? Really, you only want to live for these things. Do you want to be remembered like that? Or do you want to be remembered as the one who was filled with the Spirit and who spoke of the excellencies and the wonders and the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ? But do not get drunk on wine, we are told. The danger of wine, the greed and, and the gluttony of wine. Now, in conclusion, uh, what I want to do is I want to speak about a better way. Uh, so, so we've spoken about the, the danger of gluttony, we've spoken about the danger of wealth, and we, we've spoken about the danger of wine, and, 
And we've seen that it's not so much the things themselves, but our hearts. And what desiring these things shows us about our hearts. You see, when we desire only these things and we over-desire these things, it shows us that our hearts are set on earthly things, that our minds are not set on where they should be, where, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. The, the, the pleasure of greed and gluttony uh, and of the other five deadly sins and the pleasures of, of any sin, the so-called pleasures of sin, are temporary and destructive. But there is something so much better for those who wait. Look at chapter 23 and verses 17 to 18. Look there, right here in the middle of the chapter, uh, with lots to say about greed and gluttony and other sorts of sins. It says in verse 17, let not your heart envy sinners. So, so don't envy sinners. When, when you see those who, who seem to have it all, and they, they're gathering more and more wealth for themselves, and nothing seems to go wrong for them, and everything seems to go right, and they're, they're feasting, and they're whining and drinking, and, and they go off to this place and to that place. So what are we to do? Verse 17, Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Verse 18, Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. There is something better for those who wait. You know, other, other religions talk about our future, uh, the future life, as, as really just an extension of our, of our carnal pleasures here on earth. So you've got the, the 70 virgins or, or whatever it is. Just an extension of, of carnal pleasures here on earth. But, but our future hope, what is our future hope as Christians? It's Christ. That's our hope. Everything we desire, it is in Jesus Christ. He is our feast. He is our inheritance. He is our celebration. It is Christ. Christ will soon be ours. As soon we will see Jesus Christ. And when we see him, uh, we will be like him. Do you, do you know the biggest problem with any sin, but especially the problem with greed and, and gluttony, the biggest problem with any sin is that it dims our vision of Jesus Christ. It dims our view of Christ. As, as one writer so helpfully says, vice, it distorts the focus of the soul on God. And so we read verse 18, Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Do not make idols overly desire the things of this world so that they distort your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until we receive our future hope, we must, as the second part of verse 17 says, we must continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. You know, I, I saw an interesting parallel as I was preparing this message. I, I was thinking of Philippians chapter 3 uh, and verses 18 and 19. And you may remember there, the, Paul's, the, the Apostle Paul says, says to the Philippians that the enemies of the cross are those whose God is their, what is it? Their belly. Whose God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, and their mind is set on earthly things. And so what is their end? Their end is destruction. Gluttony and greed is evidence that our mind is set on earthly things. And that's why it's such a problem. So, so how can we continue in the fear of the Lord all the day? How, how can we possibly continue in the fear of the Lord all the day? Uh, the only possible way that we can continue in the fear of the Lord all the day is by the Holy Spirit. The, the covenant people of the Lord, we need the Spirit of Jesus Christ if we want to be imitators of Christ. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, what is it? The fruit of the Spirit is love. And, and then it goes on to say at the end, it's almost like the book ends, love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. What's the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, it says. Uh, self-control. To, to resist greed, uh, to resist gluttony is loving and it is a demonstration of our faith to be controlled in the way that we use the good gifts that God has given us. We it shows us and it reminds others and it's a testimony to the world. We don't need this world. You see, what we need is Jesus Christ. We need Christ. And so let me appeal to any of you here that maybe you came to the service and for whatever reason you've come, but you came and your mind was set on earthly things. 
and, and your heart is not set on Christ. Or maybe tonight is, is like a wheel realignment. You know, you've been drifting, but you need to get that vision right. You need to get those wheels straight, and you need to focus on the road and focus on your destination. There is our future hope. It is to be with Jesus Christ. Turn to Christ. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. He is our satisfaction. He is the quenching of our thirst. And he tells us to come to him for rest. Let us pray together. Oh God, our Father, we ask that you would have mercy upon us. Uh, We ask that you would remember not our offenses. Uh, We ask that you would be merciful and gracious towards us. Spare us, good Lord. Uh, We have uh, sinned against you. Uh, We ask that you would deliver us from all evil, uh, from sin, from the crafts and the assaults of the devil, uh, from your wrath and, and from everlasting damnation. We ask, good Lord, that you would deliver us from all blindness of heart, uh, from pride, from vain glory and hypocrisy and from envy and hatred and malice, uh, from all uncharitableness. Lord, we ask that you would deliver us from greed and from gluttony. We pray that our hearts would not be set on earthly things, but that our hearts and our minds would be focused on our Lord Jesus Christ, as you have said to us in your word tonight. Uh, There is a future hope, and our hope will not be cut off. So, Lord, give us the strength, we pray, to continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.